here. We got to bring right. Geraldo Rivera in this morning. Got <laughs> squash. Good morning. I got to ask you this. Now, we're not talking about enough squash soup with you, but uh, we will be with her dad in a little bit. Is there hypocrisy here? I mean, look, when President Obama normalizes relations with a communist country like Cuba, right? Gets on the phone, try, and with the first international flight flying there last week, and then the president, president elect, is now being criticized for taking a call from a democracy, the president of a democratically elected government in Taiwan. Yeah, but I mean, but well, I don't. Where was the outrage on the other side? Taiwan, which uh, was the sole representative of China for decades in American policy, the island of Formosa off the Chinese coast, where the nationalists fled uh, when the communists took over. Uh, mm -hmm. Pete knows the military history very well. Uh, at, at some point, Nixon went to China, big China, said, "You're the sole representative of the Chinese people." Uh, Taiwan then became kind of a, a political outlier, and our policy was to deal with China, the Republic of China. To take the call from the president of Taiwan, to take the call from the renegade island, so to speak, is a major uh, diss for the people in the Republic of China with all their, you know, hundreds of millions of people. So, uh, you know, it may be, I was just thinking about it, it is so outrageous uh, an act in terms of di diplomacy, it might be brilliant. Mm -hmm. It might be a way to jumpstart the new phase Bolton. of U.S. Chinese relations. I don't know if you caught Ambassador Bolton on our show earlier this morning who agrees with you. He thinks, he thinks it's time for a shakeup. And at the end of the day, we send a, over a hundred billion dollars of weaponry to Taiwan. So it's sort of like doing this sort of fake dance for the last thing. But here's years. the thing, though. You, you read the headlines last night, and you, if you were on Twitter at all, it felt as if we were heading into World War III. Uh, just some of these headlines there, New York Times, how Trump's call to world leaders are upsetting decades of diplomacy. It goes on and on. But you think about what actually happened, Geraldo. This was just basically a call congratulating him, to which he responded to thank you. Uh, you're wondering why there was so much outrage in that moment, not to mention he's not even sworn in yet. Well, i am be curious. Abby, to see what your dad, the former ambassador, yeah. says about it. Uh, to me, this is why you need the pros around. You need someone to say, you know, if you do that. Don't you think the pros would have been around? I mean, he wouldn't have just decided to accept the call. Someone probably counseled him, hey, this is something. Uh, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I hope. I hope, but I don't know. But knowing him. And, you know, I've known him for four decades. I, I love the guy, and 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 particularly these, uh, you know, the last six weeks of uh, Celebrity Apprentice. I was with him every day. He's the kind of guy who would just say, "Ah, screw it. I'm going to talk to him. I don't care. Ah, go, uh, you know, go uh, do some shuffle some papers in your bureaucratic <laughs> cubicle. I'm going to take the and call." And they come from out of their office, and it's trending on Twitter. They come <laughs> yeah. back to President Taiwan. I, I think it's a it's a very big deal. Uh, I, I'd be interested to see what President Obama or uh, the, 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 the White House has to say about it. Uh, but, you know, uh, what Bolton said might be true, yeah. uh, Clayton. It may be that it's time, the, in the same way it took a, 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 a right conservative President Nixon and Henry Kissinger to go and open China, right. uh, the, which was, uh, you know, uh, playing against caste. No one thought it could happen. Like, against type. No one thought yep. it could happen. A liberal or, never or, could have done it, and he, the conservative did it. Maybe now this, uh, this flamboyant new mm. entity we have in the, coming into the White House is exactly the one that's shaking well, it. Well, Reagan with the Soviet Union, the START treaties and all of that. I mean, say it takes someone who you know is an anti-communist to do that, same, same type of principle. I, I think that if, if it's handled with any kind of uh, finesse, today it'll be a one day service so it's a shake up and now we go to the Trump transition where fallout continues over the president elect's phone conversation with the president of Taiwan the phone call steering up tension and concern for China Beijing today issuing a stern response but still expressing hope that relations between the US and China would not be damaged by the diplomatic dust up Brian Yenis is live at Trump Tower here in New York City with more <clears throat> Brian Good evening, Arthel. Well, look, a president like Donald Trump is defending this phone call as congratulatory while also suggesting and downplaying the notion that this is somehow controversial by suggesting that it was the polite thing to do, uh, noting that we sell some $45 billion worth of arms with Taiwan since 1990. In a, in a tweet last night, Trump tweeting, the president of Taiwan called me today to wish me congratulations on winning the presidency. Thank you. Interesting how the U.S. sells Taiwan billions of dollars of military equipment, but I should 
did not accept a congratulatory call. Now, the Trump transition team says Taiwanese leader Tsai Ling Wan called to offer her congratulations. The call was planned. They spoke about the close economic, political, and security ties that exist between Taiwan and the United States. But in Taiwan, this is playing bigger. Uh, the, there, it's, you know, it's being seen as perhaps a potential major signal that the U.S. may boost its support of a free and sovereign Taiwan. Now, Taiwan's central news agency referred to the call between uh, both leaders as, quote, historic. They said the two spoke for roughly 10 minutes about establishing a closer cooperative relationship. Now, this is a huge sticking point with China, which is hypersensitive to this issue regarding Taiwan. China does not recognize Taiwan as a sovereign nation. They believe it is still their territory. China filed a formal, formal complaint with the U.S. Saturday, saying in part, quote, we urge the relevant parties in the U.S. to abide by the commitment to the One China policy and to handle Taiwan-related issues with caution and care to avoid unnecessarily interfering with the overall situation of China-U.S. relations. The Democratic National Committee also weighing in criticizing Donald Trump. Donald Trump is either too incompetent to understand that his foolish phone call threatens our national security, they said in a statement, or he's doing it deliberately because he reportedly wants to build hotels in Taiwan to pad his own pockets. This is a notion that is categorically denied, Arthel, by the Trump transition team. So we, we hear how the Democrats, or at least some of them, are responding. Let's go to the other side. I mean, we, we know that Senator uh, Tom Cotton, Republican senator from Arkansas, is praising Donald Trump for taking the call. How else is this playing out inside the GOP? That's right. We're seeing overall, we can see the Republicans are responding pretty positively to this. You saw the senator from Arkansas, you mentioned that, Tom Cotton Arthel. He said that, quote, that this phone call uh, reaffirms our commitment to the only democracy on Chinese soil. But interestingly enough, others like former George W. Bush Press Secretary Ari Fleischer put the phone call in perspective by tweeting, quote, uh-oh, I wasn't even allowed to refer to the government of Taiwan. I could say government on Taiwan. China will go nuts. Ari went on to say that he doesn't mind this more aggressive stance as long as President-elect Donald Trump realizes what he was getting himself into and that this was all part of a more aggressive strategy when he did this. Arthel? Okay, Brian Yen is outside there, Fifth Avenue, Trump Tower. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> And now for some insights and analysis, maybe a little perspective. Jillian Turner, Fox News contributor, former White House national security advisor under the Bush and Obama administrations. Jillian, nice to see you. You too, Leland. You look right. cold out there. Yeah, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a little chilly out here, brisk but nice. Uh, New York Times reporting this is how Trump's calls to world leaders are upsetting decades of diplomacy. Really? A couple of phone calls upsetting decades of diplomacy? or? Does decades of diplomacy need to be upset? Uh, so my take on this is that there's nothing wrong with President-elect Trump shaking up foreign policy. As you know, we've kind of been on the retreat largely on the world stage over the last decade. Our influence in many regions around the world has been diminished. But that said, what I do fault him for here, and I think was a really disastrously bad move, was his call with the Taiwanese leader. And not because he accepted the call. I think that he should absolutely, as Ambassador Bolton said earlier this morning, speak to whatever foreign leaders he wants to. The problem for me is that he inadvertently acknowledged their national sovereignty, which is not something that's in the United States national security interest. And he did that when he referred to them as a country and referred to their leader as a president. I think that was a bad move. Well, now you say you say that you think this was a bad move because you think he didn't know what he was doing, or you think he knew what he was doing, but doing that in and of itself was a bad move? If so, why? Um, I give him a lot more credit than to say this was a gaffe. Um, I think he knows exactly what he's doing at this point. I, I don't believe the critics who say um, that Mr. Trump is so ignorant at this point that he would sort of take calls willy-nilly. I think he knows exactly what he's doing, but I disagree with his decision is what I'm saying. And I think that the problem okay, here... Okay, so why? Because the problem with acknowledging Taiwanese sovereignty at this stage is that it deeply angers China. And I don't care about China's feelings. What I care about are our, our national security interests. We need the Chinese to help hedge against North Korea's nuclear program. And we need the Chinese to not sell off the billions of dollars of U.S. debt that they currently hold because that would precipitate a financial crisis here at home. You know, we heard Donald Trump take aim at the Chinese, especially during 
the election. This was sort of one of his big punching bags about they were taking our jobs, they're being in negotiations, I am going to negotiate better deals. In a way, could this perhaps be sort of the opening salvo of trying to undermine a little bit of the Chinese, take away the, uh, the comfort they have found, if you will, with the Obama administration that has given them state visits and not responded to their high hacking and cyber attacks? Absolutely. I think that's entirely 100 percent what President-elect Trump is trying to signal with this interaction. Um, and he does have a little bit more leeway to do that now than he will have in two months when he actually becomes the commander in chief and he's setting policy. At this stage, I went back and forth a lot with people on Twitter this morning. Does he have more freedom as president-elect versus being president? I think he does, but he still has to take responsibility for the fact that other foreign nations are going to interpret his actions as U.S. foreign policy at this time. So there is a you, little you bit of a up, line to tell. You picked up on this point, though, of, of other nations. And not only are the nations that this is happening to taking note, be it the Chinese or the Pakistanis, uh, as Brian Yenis was reporting, but the rest of the world is taking note. Whether, whether you're at the president's residence in France, Francois Hollande, whether you're at the Ayatollah in Iran, you're realizing, uh, to use the phrase, there's a new sheriff in town. Yeah, or at least will be. Yeah, totally. And I think that actually something that hasn't been talked a lot about uh, this week is that his nomination of General Mattis to be the Secretary of Defense sends a huge signal to the, the world, particularly to the foreign policy community. This is somebody who's steeped in U.S. foreign policy towards the Middle East, has publicly said that that's where our focus needs to be as a nation. And I think that part of his nomination is President Trump signaling, you know what, I know the Obama administration pivoted towards Asia, but we're going to pivot back to the Middle East because that's where the security threats are emanating from right now. Well, something John Mattis has been incredibly outspoken about, just as John Bolton has on the short list for Secretary of State, is Iran. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, General Mattis has said multiple times over the past couple of years um, that he believes Iran is the number one sort of, aside from terrorism, the number one yeah. uh, national security threat the United States uh, faces. Um, he was very critical of the Iran nuclear deal, but interestingly, and I agree with him on this, he also doesn't think that we should renege on it at this point in time. As bad as and flawed as the deal was, we've got to live with it. Well, uh, what you just said, among other things, may be the subject of some discussion on Twitter when you get off. Uh, she's available anytime, at Jillian Turner. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thanks, Leland. All right.